a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. Larry Paul, welcome back. Uh, the great thing about having you back on, my friend, and um, kind of reintroducing you to the audience here is that I can just link the episode below and you can give just a brief intro of who you are rather than the let's find out who you are for the first time thing. So we're going to jump right into the material that you've got. Larry Paul, of course, the American Institute for Pyramid Research. You've got an amazing uh, presentation set up for us here already, as you do. And my friend, you're just one of my favorite explorers. You're one of my favorite researchers. And I just want to let the audience know ahead of our conversation here that this will be a video presentation by you. You've done an incredible job here. So if you'd like to, guys, check out the audio-only audience. Go ahead and check the video link in the show description, and it will lead you straight to this presentation here. Now, Larry, can't thank you enough. It's good to see you, my man. How have you been? That's great. You know, I just, uh, not too many days back from Egypt, I've caught up with my jet lag, I think. Um, and uh, I'm down here to give a talk in uh, Florida to be on the podcast with you. And, uh, you know, I I uh, am just really uh, an explorer. I mean, be, my life in Giza was filled by daily exploring new things. I've been unpacking it here at home. I am the full-time director of the American Institute for Pyramid Research. That's what I do. It's who I am. Shout out. And, uh, you know, it's real. It's real, you know. It's real. It's incredibly real. In episode 59, it's titled The Real Indiana Jones, guys. It's linked down below. That's your first appearance on the show here. So definitely check that out and find out why he is called that. And we're going to get further reminder of it here today. So Larry, I can't wait, man. So just kick it off, brother. What, what, where do you want to start? Well, um, you can see on the screen here, it says entering the tomb of the birds, one of the few people in decades to enter this mysterious entrance to the Giza underworld. Now, one of my followers on Instagram had told me that a friend of theirs uh, had said that the, the tomb of the birds was open. Now, you know, if you follow Andrew Collins and, and his work on the tomb of the birds, I mean, Zahi Awas locked that place up a long time ago. It's had iron bars on it and it's off limits. You know, parts of the Giza plateau are just off limits. But I still put it on my list of things to, to, to do. So I picked a day that uh, was a Muslim holiday, and I know that they work with a skeleton tr crew in terms of guards, because I had tried the day before to go there. Uh, it's near the new Khufu restaurant uh, that, that's on the uh, plateau there. And so I thought, well, I'll head, I'll pretend like I'm going to the restaurant, and then I'll just kind of walk back around to where it is. And guard just grabbed me and said, nope, 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 go that way. Okay. So again, I didn't give up the next day, Muslim holiday. I knew they would work with the more skeleton crew. Instead of attacking it by the restaurant, I went out to where some of the Western tomb field is, which is also off limits, but I just thought I could get out there. And then I, I walked toward the tomb of the birds from there. So I, at one point where I came out of the shadows of the, of the tombs and could see, you know, the restaurant, I knew I was going to be in an open position where I could be seen for a while. And I thought I saw a guard up there looking at me. I thought, okay, I'm done, but I'm still going to do it, you know. And I just kept walking. And I finally got to where the hill behind the restaurant blocked my view. So the guy couldn't see me anymore. And I walked around and I couldn't believe it. There I was looking at the tomb of the birds and it was unchained. That iron bar door was open and I was plainly there. And I mean, I about S in my pants. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Because the people people that follow this is like that's like that's like one of the that's a unique mystery. It's like you know because everybody always talks about the the, the cave system that's underneath Giza. You know the tunneling system that Zahi Awas won't talk about that Mark Lehner and all these guys know about, but they don't talk about. Well, that's this is supposedly the entrance to that. You know this is this is a place of high significance. So I did get in. I took a bunch of measurements, uh, some of which I'll share with you here. 
and uh, and I, and I it was it was dark, and I didn't have you know good good lighting. You know, uh, one of the things I do, like the reason I'm wearing my hat for a podcast, so I don't really need it in in the house, but it says I'm working. When I put the hat on, just like when I was a catcher in baseball, I played semi-pro baseball. You know, you put the catcher's mask on, it means you're doing business, okay? I'm I'm doing this. Well, when I go out in the field, I put a vest on. Every day when I get up in the morning in Egypt, I put a vest on. In it, I've got a laser measure. I've got small change to go to the bathroom to tip people. I've got big change to for backsheesh to pay people off in one pocket. I've got, you know, I've got a light in one pocket. I've got a GoPro extra camera in one. So I got everything. When I put that vest on, I'm ready for work. And so uh, the the light that I had in there in my vest had a weak battery in it. So again, I didn't tool up enough. I should so so some of the people said the footage was hard to see. It's just because you know I I didn't have that great of a light. And also, I was alone, and I thought if I go down one of those rabbit holes there and I break a leg or I hurt myself, you know, you know, I know that, that the internet's not going to work down there. I'm not going to be able to call anybody. You know, I could, I could be lost forever kind of thing. So um, I'd like to go back. It's hard to plan these things because, again, it's it was serendipitous that it was open for me. But I did see that, you know, there are uh, it, it looked like one of the, the main tunnels had been blocked up. It looked like the, the Egyptian government had pushed a, pushed a bunch of sand in there, a whole bunch of sand and covered one of the main holes. That would have been, I think might have been the one that Andrew took to go you know deeper under the plateau so that that's plainly been sanded over but there's one on the uh west side where you could go down and that one might have been promising you know to really try and you know tool up and go farther but you know you'd think that because they had the door open maybe they've blocked off you know all entries. I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to be open. I just know it was open that day and, and I got in. Dude, let's go find out. I, I'll go with you. I'll, I'll go first. I'll make sure all the flashlights are charged up. Let's absolutely do this Tomb of the Birds <laughs> thing. I've got to yeah. do this. And Andrew yeah. Collins is who you were talking about, wrote a book about how he explored under and got really, really far. And if, if you don't mind, just touch on that because you made a video on this. Uh, and again, guys, all the ways to find him, all of his research, everything linked below, including that video. So tell yeah, us about yeah, what I Andrew mean, Collins is. You got to read what he said. It's exciting because, you know, it's like a, you know, a King Tut moment. You know, he's finding something that like, you know, like this is the first, you know, and then, you know, just for reasons of danger and stuff, they, they, they didn't go any farther. They went as far as they did. And so, uh, and I always thought at the time, see, now I'm in the position, I, I thought at the time I read, oh, you chicken, you and your wife, you chicken. You know, it's like, well, here, here, now here, I'm the guy. <laughs> but the reason I chose to spend time taking measures is because I've learned that, you know, so many, uh, when they, when they go like, uh, Chris Naughton, the, the Egyptologist, he's an independent Egyptologist. He's one that actually communicates with me. He did a Smithsonian uh, special in 2017 on the Lost Pyramid. They found this pyramid. It was in the Dashur field, and it had never been opened. It had plainly never been opened. So, you know, antiquities is out there. They had the big timbers up there. They had the hoist. They're lifting the thing out, you know, and so and they opened up. There's nothing in it, and it's plain. It never had been robbed. No, Nobody would have put this thing back the way it was. It was sealed hermetically the way it was originally put. There's nothing in it. And I, I could tell you a couple other stories, exactly the same story. Well, it's because Egyptologists have jettisoned, forgotten one of the greatest diagnostic tools available to them, metrology. They use pottery. Pottery is probably the main diagnostic tool for archaeologists, but metrology is a much better one. And that's what's in, that's, that's the treasure. Oh, they're, they're so disappointed because there's no King Tut in there. There's no mummy. You're disappointed because you don't realize that they left you some, something precious in the measurements of, of that tomb. That That's part, because so much can be communicated through measure. You know, just, you know, I've, I've learned so much that it's like, that's the real treasure. That's one of the real treasures. It really is. And so, uh, you know, that's why I spent time instead of breaking a leg and going down a rabbit hole. Where there was this rope down there and a hole and stuff. I thought, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this and I'll I'll tool up and get in a couple strong men in a rope and then we'll go back in there and then I will do it. Then I won't chicken out. <laughs> Hell yeah, sign me up, dude. I'm telling you, I am there, absolutely there. Well, that's great. You know, so uh, out behind me over here is the new Grand Egyptian Museum. And it's pointed toward Khufu, Khafre, and Menkara. They designed the building so it points to the Great Pyramids over here. 
But right now, I'm standing in front of the entrance to the underworld. This is the fabled Tomb of the Birds, which I made a conscious goal to come to today. I thought I would be stopped by guards. In the past, it's been locked by Dr. Hawass and other authorities with that iron gate. But today, I entered the Tomb of the Birds. Andrew Collins first discovered this and walked quite a ways in the tunneling system in Giza, but just came to a spot where it was, he could hardly breathe, the bat dung, the dangers that, that he sensed there, the snakes and the spiders and stuff. And so he, he chronicles in his book how far he got. By myself, you know, I could fall, break a leg. I'm not going to do any heroics today, but I did come, go inside and examine some of the tunnels, the beginning of the tunnels and the Tomb of the Birds, the entrance to the underworld, the mysteries of Egypt. Okay, so here is a view of where you go straight in. So you go in that door where I just made the video, and if you walk straight in, it comes to this. This is the burial area. There's there's an antechamber. Uh, I think I'll show a picture of that in a minute and uh, other places. But this was what I measured. This was, I thought, th this is what I want to, uh, you know, see, see what I can find here. Um, there is, uh, you can see that my shadow is being cast onto that burial area because, again, the door is straight behind me, and you can see my shadow cast there. So this is the burial vault for the, uh, the Tomb of the Birds here. The King Khufu restaurant is up above me, so look for that on Google Earth. So now I'm going to go into this uh, this antechamber over here. This the bird just flew in here, so I don't want to get you know have somebody attack me here. But the bird came in here. There must be places to go. What's that over there? You've got to be careful falling a long way down. I almost went 60 feet down to my death one time. You got to have a light. Is this a is this a deep pit or not? No, that looks like it. Does that go up? I don't know. Does this go into a cave or does this come to an end here? So you're just you're, you're like with me live. You're with me when I was... Yeah, birds probably got a nest in here somewhere because I saw them fly in. Oh, hi, birdie. Wherever you are. I need a better light. All right. I don't... This one doesn't... It sure smells in here, though, like the, you know, guano. So let's go back out over here. What's that shape? A lion? State of Texas, what do we got there? Okay. The antechamber to the Tomb of the Birds. The mysteries of Egypt. So there it is. And uh, so here again is uh, the the burial place. And there's this niche there. Well, so what I did was I used, I had a tape measure with me uh, in, in my vest, but I, I use, uh, the Google measure app a lot. So, you know, I pulled it out and this, this is some rough measurements I took to try and get the size of the opening. Okay. And then I wanted to get that niche. I thought that niche is placed there. That's intentional. There, there's gotta be something going on with that niche. So I made sure I measured that. Okay. So this is the, with the, the Google earth tool. And I also, uh, took my, my tape measure on it. And so, uh, there's a, a likeness of, of it. So the length is uh, 3.5 feet. The width is 0.584 feet. And uh, the depth, 0.792 feet. I, I had to interpolate a little bit with some of the measures. This is basically pretty accurate there. Okay. So the volume is 1.618 cubic feet. I mean, I couldn't believe when it came out with that. that that's five. <laughs> that five. That's the yeah. <laughs> golden number. It's five feet cube. It's like, I, 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 you know, because if I would have done this in, in meters, it wouldn't have come out to 1.618. If I would have done it in, in uh, you know, maybe fractional inches, but I, I was working with the, with, with the, because I did have a laser measured too. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that that's how I found that. So message, we know the foot and we know fine. Now, I have a lot of people telling me all the time, oh, the, the Egyptians didn't know the foot. And but you know, phi is everywhere. So so they're playing these. Shows. So so one of the messages they're given here is that you know don't don't treat us too lightly. You know we put this little niche here and we encoded the foot and we encoded phi. So uh, the the metrologist John Michelle, uh, view over Atlantis, uh, John Neal, all done with mirrors. Harry Siebertson. I I become a, a part of this group and they're world class metrologists and they're they're not 
in mainstream science. They're, they're totally rational. They're doing, they're measuring the earth. They're doing something that's totally practical, tangible, rational, and scientific. And yet for some reason, they're not part of the mainstream. And so they discovered it was a big revelation to them that all the systems of measure in the world, and I mean all of them, you know, Chinese, Mesopotamian, uh, Roman, Greek, British, are all ancient, you know, and, and that they're all connected by whole integral values. It's just absolutely unbelievable. And so the, many of them think that the, the, the imperial system might have been the original, uh, the original system, but whether that's true or not. Uh, you know, it's it's you know if you if you go by what you learned in eighth grade, of course the Egyptians didn't know the foot. But if you want to go beyond what you learned in eighth grade and you study the metrologists who are not in the mainstream, but they're totally rational people dealing with a very tangible thing, measurement, it's uh, it's undeniable. So, anyways, I, I just thought that was incredible. And then uh, the rest of the uh, the burial chamber there, uh, you know, uh, five point four four feet for the the length. The height pi three point one four feet, and uh, then if you so if you take that proportion, you get point one point seven three two, which is of course the square root of three. I remember one time I was with Robert Grant on his tour, and we walked inside a, a chapel. It, it's it, it was in uh, Karnak, I think it was a chapel for hot chips, but and we, uh, uh, yep. we okay here. Oh yeah, okay. we're good. Mm -hmm. you hear me? It, it just told me I'd lost the microphone. So, so we we put some quick tools on it, and and in this little bath, we found that the square root of three was in there. And uh, so, what this says to me, putting the square root of three there, if you take just a unit, a unit square, one by one by the the diagonal of every unit square is root two. So that's two dimensional. You know, you're you're doing a plan on paper. That's two dimensional. You're thinking about something. It's two dimensional. But if you take a cube, that same square, but now you add another dimension. Well, the diagonal of that cube is root three. So for a unit square, it's root two, but for the cube, it's root three. So moving from 2D to 3D, moving from planning something on a two-dimensional surface to actually outfitting an expedition to go somewhere, that's 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 3D. So I, I, I look as the square root of three symbolically saying, you know, there, there's something to this burial box here. We, we want to just not have a mummy. We want it to rise again. We want to move to the next level. So that's that's what that says to me. So that's why I spent time measuring and didn't, you know, didn't try it. Because I just knew that, I, I didn't show a picture, but the, the, the Western uh, chamber, as soon as you walk in that door, on your right, which is the West, if you go down there, there was a two huge, planks to one was going down in, in down into the chamber and and uh it had a rope sitting right on it and there was a hole down below so if i would have had somebody with me we could have climbed down that plank i could have tied the rope around my waist the other person could have held it up there and i could have started going down that hole and see where that leads and see if that goes to one of the giza tunnels so it was like you know, being alone, I just thought I'm not going to even try because I could. It was very precarious. If you saw it, I could have fallen off the, you know, the, the and then it was way down there, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, I like you say, next time. <laughs> next time, man, for sure. Do that next time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So where does the tomb of the birds fit at Giza? OK, so, you know, there, there's so much you see so many of these master plans of Giza that show how it's a unified plan. It's not three separate pharaohs each doing their own thing. I mean, so what's the what's the chances seriously that Biden and Trump are going to work on a project together? I mean, seriously. And here you got these three pharaohs right in a row and more that obviously worked to a plan bigger than themselves. They obviously didn't just individually decided where to put their pyramids there was a there was a master plan so i always want to see where things fit in i've, I've discovered so many things and so many other people have I, i'm just totally excited what robert grant is putting out just today uh, he put out it's a you know it's a he put out a video on his channels telegram and and uh, instagram about uh you know the all the uh slope angles of the pyramids are the musical scale all 15 you know increments of the musical scale are in these pyramids it's like it's music it's music. So that, that's just another one of many evidences of a master plan. It's not by chance that you just happen to hit 15, you know, intervals on the musical scale. I just, it, it's not, it, it's, so it's beautiful because now it's saying the master plan isn't just the guy's really good at geometry 
it's like the guy singing the guy is singing like this is this is there's now no, no there's joy in this there there's there, there's you know it's it's anyway so so anyways i want to see where the, the you know the tomb of the birds fits at giza so here's something gary osborne put together you know the giza plateau it's a precessional clock and so that's the kind of thing i was looking for what, what can we find with with the tomb of the birds okay so one place that, that I go to is the Holy Shaft, which I discovered. It's this nondescript shaft. It's a little bit north of the Capri Causeway. It's just, it's sort of like a, you know, I say it's a circle within a square. You can see the circular hole in it. And so the circle and square is an ancient, you know, symbol of, of the microcosm and the macrocosm, you know, God and man, heaven and earth. And and so it's 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 got this, you know, kind of mystery built into it, but it's it's this nondescript shaft. So it's a humble shaft, and yet I found it's connected to everything. It's like, you know, it's like if you go to an Amish barn building, you see all these guys like busy bees. They're, everybody's doing something. The Amish are working. You'd have to really hunt to find the guy who's directing all that. Because there is. If you go to an Amish barn building, there's one guy who's giving out all the dimensions. But he's a quiet guy off in some corner. And you'd have to really study. It's, it's not like in a, hey, you you do this over there. Hey, 16, you do that. It's like everybody's coming to him. He's just quietly. That's what this shaft is. It's like it's quiet. So so here's, uh, uh, you know, one of, my, one of my discoveries about the Holy Shaft. So there it is right there, that little blue dot, uh, you know, just north of the Capri Causeway. And so I found this cir circle that touches the four main your mo major monuments that are there. Khufu on the on the southeast corner, uh, Khafri on the on the eastern edge right through the middle of the Sphinx and right through the middle of Kankawis. So those are the four major tombs and it goes right through them. Okay. And if you look at it, it's 888 feet and in some places it's 887.04, which is 504 Noachian cubits, the ancient cubit. Okay. So that circumference is 3168 ancient cubits. All right. Now, where is the ancient cubit used? Well, it's used in Roslyn Chapel, Solomon's Temple, Shatras Cathedral, the Ark of Noah, the Ark of the Covenant, the Khufu boat. So it's, there's a wide application of this ancient cubit. Okay. All right. So, the Great Pyramid, it's 3168 Egyptian inches in the perimeter. So you got my holy circle, 3168, the Great Pyramid, 3168. Now let's put Stonehenge down here. And let's take the, the outer, the Aubrey Circle there. And the Aubrey Circle is 316.8 feet. So you got 3168, 3168, two major stone monuments and a virtual circle that I discovered, okay? So you could square that circle, and of course, it's going to have the same perimeter, because that's what it means to square the circle. You can square my holy circle, and again, you're going to get the same thing, because that's what it means to square the circle. Okay, so you got all these 3168s, okay? 3168. Okay, now, let's take what the side length would be on each one of those squares we just made. So over here at Stonehenge, it's 79.20. That's one side. Okay, on, on the Great Pyramid, it's 7,920 inches, 7920. Again, if you go to my holy uh circle squared the side is 792.0 ancient cubits all right isn't it interesting that the diameter of planet earth is 7920 miles okay so so that holy shaft i discovered that humble little holy shaft is the center of a circle that reveals all this and also if you put the square around the earth it's 3168 miles so the 3168 that's everywhere here, you know, it's one thing to find it on Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid. You'd expect that. They're big monuments. But I discovered a virtual circle where they hid these same things. So I, I consider this my, my greatest discovery because it's on par with Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid, but nobody knows about it. It's a virtual circle I discovered, but it's plainly there. Okay, and this is another amazing thing to me. In Stonehenge, this number is revealed in feet. In the Great Pyramid, this number is revealed in inches. In my holy circle, this number is revealed in cubits, and on the earth, it's miles. Holy cow. <laughs> That's why I call it the holy circle. I'm sorry. Incredible. This, this is it's incredible. Okay, so it's a humble shaft connected to everything. All right, now, I've got a paper in academia, where I, and I hardly ever talk about it, and, and it's gotten, gotten like maybe a thousand views or something. It's, it's, it's gotten more views than a lot of papers on academia. So what I show is that from this holy shaft to major monuments all over Giver, it's exact 100 foot increments. To the Khufu Pyramid, it's a thousand feet to the southwest corner. To the Pyramid Menkar, 2300 feet. Easternmost Menkar satellites, 2500. The entrance to the Khufu Satellite Pyramid, 900 feet. Entrance to the Trial Passages, 1500 feet. Khafri Satellite Pyramid, 1300 feet. Osiris Shaft is 200 feet away from this. The Great Sphinx is a thousand feet away. 
etc. I mean, this it's incredible that this humble shaft is connected by even 100 foot increments. All right. So, for instance, the Sphinx right there to the Sphinx, you know, it's uh, it was uh, a thousand a thousand feet. Okay. Okay. This this is a major revelation. This is a major revelation. This is a major revelation. Okay, so this is the holy shaft that I've talked about a lot, especially in relationship to the, you know, the circle that touches all the major monuments around here, you know, including the Sphinx and Khufu. And I, I've got a, a, a paper on academia that I hardly ever talk about, but this, this shaft is connected by even 100 foot distances to all kinds of things. For instance, the Osiris shaft is right over there. I forgot what it was. I think it was like an even 2,000 feet or something. 200. So it's it, there are increments of 100 feet. It, like the measure is either 900 feet or 1,500 feet. That's incredible. So this this thing has got amazing for measurements. So the amazing thing here is that I've noticed this boss. It has a boss. There's a plain boss. That's not, you know, you just need courses, horizontal courses to hold up a well, okay? You don't need that. That's decorative. The same thing is on the front of the Sphinx. The same thing, and I just put the tools on it. This is exactly 90 degrees straight east. So this lines up, this lines up with the boss that's on the front of the Sphinx. They're exactly lined up. So now I'm gonna measure, I'm gonna measure from there to the boss on the front of the Sphinx and see what it is. And you know, th this is this is lower in the ground. I've been trying, it's very hard with the tools I have. It's very, it's very hard to see exactly what the depth of that is. I've got several different tools, but none of them can really accurately because of distances and shadows and, and my inability to climb out here. And even if I if I could, I could probably get it. If somebody held a rope and I was given permission to go down there, then we could totally get the measurements on there. Right now, I can't get them. But um, that looks like it might be a, at the same height. No, there's there's more drop than that. There's more drop in the no, plateau. Yeah. No. But I was thinking that might be actually at the height of the Sphinx, because even be though it's down low in this hole, the, the Sphinx is way down because the on the plateau. Low. You know what I'm saying? Like that. Okay, so, so uh, I put the tools on it. So here's the holy shaft and uh, where uh, that boss is on the Sphinx. And it's exactly 300 meters. So from boss to boss, is exactly 300 meters. I thought, holy crap, I found a whole bunch of even 100 increments in feet. And now we've got an, from, from boss to boss, the boss on the front of the Sphinx is facing east. And this boss in the holy shaft is facing west. I think they're probably close to being at the same level. But whether they are or not measured across the top, it's exactly 300 meters. You can do it yourself on Google Earth. Just go from the holy shaft to, the, to where the boss is. So I thought that's incredible. It's incredible. It's, it's amazing. So I, I have to ask you, are you, how wide is the shaft? Do you know that hole? Well, you know, uh, this is so interesting too. I, I measured the square around it, which is a, a, the a fence erected by the Egyptian government, but it's put into a, a foundation that seems like it was there, even though if it was rebuilt, it was the original foundation and it's 100 feet around. So here it is, 100 feet to all these things, and it's 100 feet around. And I forgot if it was it was an even 25, 25, 25, 25, or was, if it was a 26, 26, 24, 24. But the point is, the distance around it is 100, 100 feet. And I did measure it while I was there, because that was on Google Earth, which is a pretty good measuring tool. But I actually tried to physically measure it this time, too. And I, I'd have to go through my notes and stuff, but I, I forgot what it came to. I remember I pretty much affirmed it's it's 100 feet. So, so Because I was I curious if... If when you're measuring to these distances, that it's from the outside of the shaft too, or if it's from dead center of the shaft well, out. Well, see, and that's, I talk about that in, in I, I show in one of my videos I did where I took several centers, like, you know, you, I put across from this part to that part and this part to that part, that's the center. But if you start over here, because again, there's a couple of fudge factors. So, but now I'm thinking it might be from the boss. There were probably was an obelisk there at one time is what I'm thinking. So we can't know exactly where to measure from. And that... That could be charged against me for when I say they're exactly 100 feet. I tried to take them all from what I ascertained as the center. I just picked a point as the center. But there is a little bit of a fudge factor there. And so, but even people like Jerry Lucas, when he wrote his book, Theomatics, where he, he shows the the the, uh, 
gematria of, of verses in the Bible, and like 1,500 is light. So a bunch of verses that talk about light, when you add up all the characters, they're, they're 1,500. But he made it, he did a little fudge factor there. Sometimes it's 1,501, sometimes it's 1,502. So I think, you know, something like that might operate here because it's not exact. If it, if it was an exact point that said, this is the starting point, then you could say exactly it's, you know, and, and the other question is, what part of the monument do you measure to? Like, I tried to right. measure to, a, a, like, when I said it's to the trial passages, I said the entrance of the trial passages. That means the door. I measured to the entrance of the trial passages. When I measured to the Sphinx, I measured to a, a, a major part of the Sphinx. So all these measurements, when I, because other, otherwise, you know, you've got a little bit of a fudge factor. I could choose a different corner and blah, blah, blah. But to me, it's beyond chance. You know, it's just beyond chance. And this this was me not trying to fudge it. You could do it yourself. You you, you can see, go to the Holy Shaft. There's good measuring tools on Google Earth. Put Try and center it as best you can, and then drag that measuring tool over to the, the front chest of the Sphinx, which is where the boss is, and you're, you're going to get 300 meters. I mean, that's just, that's just what it is. You know what I found so interesting, too, is that you said that something may have been in it. So do you think that maybe it was a receptacle, almost like a a holder for a giant obelisk that may have been either removed or possibly even sank. Have you seen this uh, idea of liquefaction where the ground just shakes so much things just sink into it like water? The, the ground basically turns into water because of these violent earthquakes. So that that's honestly a two-part question. Do you think that something yeah. could have been in there as a gigantic monument? And then the question is, well, where the hell did it go? And yeah, then well, you know, could it have just obelisks sank? were, you know, you uh, you, you stay, uh, obelisks were taken by people all over the world. You know, the Romans took a bunch yeah, of obelisks. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. obelisks were taken everywhere. So, you know, uh, it, there, I, I think there probably was simply because it's a measuring point. I mean, you couldn't by chance. I mean, seriously, people always charge. Oh, you're cherry picking. All right, just do this. Take the middle of your front porch, okay, and then go around and calculate the middle of all your neighbors' front porches. And then you tell me when you measure each one of those, what the chances are they're all going to be increments of 20. Are they all going to be increments? Of, seriously. I mean, the, the idea that I cherry picked this, come on. <laughs> when 100 is even more, you could have said 10, and then that's a, that's a pretty decent fudge factor. But you're talking about increments of hundreds, and that's even more fascinating to me. I think it's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. Like whole I mean, discovery. I, 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 I plan to revisit that paper just because I haven't done much with it. And I keep thinking, gosh, nobody ever asked me about that or talks about that paper like, Holy cow. That's it's so interesting. Yeah. I'm glad you brought it up. And I think it's even more interesting that there's a bust down there, that there's some sort of eroded, uh, I guess, like you said, uh, accoutrement down there to make it look more beautiful or probably, like you said, to be a marker. Because then you think, well, maybe that's just that sand and that rubbish down there. Do you think that it's possibly literally a, an entrance to the underworld down there that just got filled in maybe? Because then I'm thinking like if you were traversing under the desert there and you come to this giant hole – then you look up and you're like, oh, where am I going? It might be signpost markers to sort of the direction you're going from underground, maybe. And that yeah, bust you know, may have that, said, hey, the Sphinx is this way if you keep going. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I I have no idea. You know, it's it's so hard to get information about that. You ask the local Egyptologists, they, they don't know anything about it. Um, you know, you can, I, I've, I've tried to ransack the literature a little bit, and I, I'm sure there's more I could do that way. There has been a little bit written on those shafts, but, you know, Egyptologists have largely abandoned Giza. Mark Lehner's the big exception, and Zahi Was because he worked there for years. But the, I learned that I presented paper, you know, two papers at major Egyptological conferences in, at the, the RC conference in Alexandria, Virginia, in uh, 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 2019, and in uh, Toronto in 2020, which ended up becoming virtual because of COVID. So I presented papers, and I learned a little bit about the culture of Egyptologists, because I'm not an Egyptologist. I'm an independent researcher. You know, an Egyptologist has a PhD in Near Eastern languages or some you know, specific fields that Egyptologists allow. And I don't have, you know, I've got master's degrees in political science and education and theology, but I don't have, so I'm not an Egyptologist. But but my papers were accepted because they're blind, peer-reviewed. So now I'm among the Egyptologists, uh, you know, make my presentations and there was some buzz in in both years about return to giza in other words we've largely abandoned giza john romer the egyptologist the australian egyptologist in his book about the great pyramid says why am i the only egyptologist in a hundred years to write a serious book about the great pyramid now of course <laughs> in saying that he's slapping zahia was and and mark Lehner because they've got the coffee table books the real expensive a lot of pictures the complete guide to the pyramids but it's not a serious study of the pyramid. It's a bunch of aides putting together all the, you know, the encyclopedic stuff about all the different pyramids. 
Romer's saying, I went to the Great Pyramid study. Why am I the first Egyptologist in 100 years to do this? And he, and he, he slams the profession. Well, it's because they have abandoned Giza because so many crazy people like me, because I'm a crazy person to them, you know, like th there's so many esoteric people that they don't want to tarnish their reputation, their, their reputation, their professional reputation is very important to them, as it is most people in most professions. And they don't want to be labeled as a crazy. Well, the buzz I heard in 2019 and 2020 returned to Giza. There are excavations going on at Giza now. It's like when you go down to Luxor, there's almost always an excavation. You can see them working. There are now excavations going on at Giza. So what I heard, 2019, 2020, return to Giza, it's happening a little bit. And uh, you know, I could say more about that. So anyways, but I want to get to this right here, though. Yeah, this what I like about that, just real quick, is that, sure. you know, it seems that the Egyptologists kind of buried a bunch of things there, which is why guys like you came in and said there's got to be more to the story here. And when you started discovering it, perhaps uncovering things that actual Egyptologists probably were... I want to say incentivized to suppress, then when you start opening these things and then you have folks um, like uh, Graham Hancock and everybody making all these claims and now they're making a lot of money on it on Netflix, then there's going to be a reinvestment into the area simply because there's a ton of money now because there's a lot of craving for the new discovery. We're done being told what the old pyramids were from that point of view. We've come a lot further with this, especially with dudes like you going out there and doing this, man. You're one of my favorites. My my pioneer in my mind is you. And you're out here <laughs> doing this because you've brought the information to us, which has just lit us up with the new implications. Because what they told us about these fascinating monuments is nothing compared to what you're finding because the implications are so much greater. And so when you introduce that, now perhaps, again, now I'm, my mind takes it in two different directions. There's a scramble to go there to uncover or to take out a bunch of stuff before you get your ass over there, Larry, and find it before they do. Uh, the other one would be to perhaps spin a narrative around what is, air quotes, newly discovered when they do come in and do this so that they can make sure that they have a grip on the narrative first. I don't know. It just seems interesting that, the, that it has taken a turn back from this classical dynastic sort of look at it to guys there was something so much more interesting going on there when now we're talking about the harmonic resonances and all of that it just seems that you're inspiring a rediscovery in the story so i'm grateful that you're doing what you're doing dude well and they're, they're, on the big end they are doing their job in this sense uh I, when i was there a few years ago i met with the uh dr El Damati, who was the Minister of Antiquities from 2014 to 2016 and he's the one that commissioned both the thermal study which is so interesting about the Great Pyramid, and he commissioned the Scan Pyramid Study. Even though we say their results were in 2017, he hired them in 2016. He's the one that wanted to do that. And he didn't invite Zahi Awas to the press conference. Zahi was so pissed and was on his website and stuff because he was a real honest man. And, and so he's the one that brought the Scan Pyramids team in there. That's a, that's real science. Yeah. The proof is that we had that press conference in March, uh, and they revealed – photographs taken of the small void, which they had discovered in 2017, but only virtually through muons. Now they actually got an endoscopic camera through the chevrons and took a picture of it. Well, I know for a fact that the great void, they found that one too. They just haven't revealed that yet. As a matter of fact, the great void is another grand gallery. It's like a it's like a mimic of the Grand Gallery. So when you see when you look at the images online, it's like this cloudy thing because it's muons. It's cloudy. No, it's not cloudy. It's just as finessed as the Grand Gallery, and they're going to be announcing that one. And uh, and so you know that's that's something that they should do because we we're not going to be able to put muon collectors all over the place. That's big science. That's big money. The Egyptian government has to do that. And they are charged with the responsibility that every country is charged with being a steward of its heritage. And that's really a relatively recent thing. I mean, you could walk into the Colosseum in 1935 and take whatever you wanted to and go home. It took the Italian government a while to protect that. I could tell stories about the Dominican Republic, Columbus, the oldest houses, the oldest house in the New World. I've been there. I was there before they did anything. It was like there was no Columbus slept here kind of thing. So the point is it takes a, a country a while to figure out the best way to be a steward of its resources. And the Egyptian government has that responsibility. Now, we always talk about how they've mismanaged it. They're so tight-fisted and, and people always say they're hiding things. I always say when people say, no, they're not. They, they, they don't see it. If they were hiding it, it means they knew it. They don't know it. They don't. <laughs> what what do you what do you think though about that maybe just like the original because the one of the guys that discovered the the chamber he went up there and put some graffiti allegedly 
that marked the name so that he could tie it to Khufu, right? And that's where they got the idea that it was a pyramid, that it was a tomb. Do you think that they could finally sort of solidify that idea, if you will, by getting in there early and just doing a better job of faking it? Well, what they need to do is, uh, Scott Creighton talks about this in his book, The Great Pyramid Hoax, is even Scott Creighton, who's written one of the strongest books against that graffiti, saying it doesn't prove that Khufu built the Great Pyramid, because, of course, right. Egyptologists say it's a slam dunk. That graffiti proves that Khufu built the Great Pyramid. So even Scott Crichton, who wrote the book, trying to, trying to, and he doesn't hide it, he's trying to dismantle that narrative. He admits that most of the graffiti up there is real. So even Scott Crichton admits, now, when Zahi Awas took Graham Hancock, John Anthony West, and Robert Bavall up there, they are all committed to it not being there. They all came out. They can deny today. Graham can de deny it now. I guarantee that when they came out, they all said that graffiti is real. John, John Anthony West said it in, in the strongest terms. He says, he says, you're an idiot if you say that graffiti isn't real. So they all came out saying it's real. So everybody says there's real stuff there. The question is, is some of it forged? That's the question. And that's the question the Egyptian government could go in there, because it seems to me there should be a big difference between an, a red ochre paint mark that's 4,000 or 5,000 years old and a red ochre paint mark that's at 100 or 200 years old. That should be real easy to figure out. You would think. And so why they don't conduct it, I, I, one of my professors, when I was studying hieroglyphics at the University of Chicago, is a well-known Egyptologist, and he's an expert in, in, in uh, hieratic script, and some of that script is hieratic. And I asked him to get involved, and he, he didn't do it, he just laughed it off, because this is the old boy circuit. Those guys saying that, Scott Crichton and those boys, they're not Egyptologists, so I don't have to answer that, because they're not in the club. That was really his attitude. A man that could have taken his expertise and gone up there and said some some real things. So, anyways, I've written a piece in response to Scott Crichton's book, and and uh, in a nutshell, you know, I say this, and people are not going to like it because everybody wants that to not not be real. But you know, Scott Crichton, one of the major things he says is that that Vice must have found a stash of writing somewhere that had those names on it because one of the points is the Majedu name of, of Khufu was there and no Egyptologist in the world at the time of Vice knew that that was one of the, the, divine, the, the, the divine names of Khufu and it's in there. So Vice would have been the smartest Egyptologist in the world if, if he put it in there because no Egyptologist knew that was so. So what Scott Crichton says is that Vice couldn't have forged that because he didn't know Majedu was one of the names. So he says that Vice must have found a group of writings somewhere that he never told anybody about. And he told his forgers, okay, put these marks up there. Because again, he didn't know that was Kupu's name. So that's, that's and, and as, as Scott Crichton develops his argument, he makes that stash, act, he, he talks about it as if it's real. It's something he invented. He said he he surmised that Vice found this, which Vice was prolific in putting things in his journals and stuff, and he doesn't write a word about it anywhere. So now Scott Crichton is doing the same thing he's charging Vice with. He's making something up. And so he does make a bunch of good points, but that that is a point that he makes, and he, he, he surmises something, and then he starts talking about it like it's real. And so if you go on the book, we're talking about this stuff that Vice found, which is something he made up. So the point is, there, yes, real science could get at the bottom of this question. And there's, there's, there's people obviously hanging on both sides. You know, some people want that to all be false. And the Egypt, Egyptologists want it to all be, you know, real. And, and they, could, they could help settle that. They could. And either way, shut the boys club up, you know, as it were. Yeah. It just it seems like it wasn't worth his time to even debunk, you know, just to put it to rest. And he would yeah, because but, he'd, be, but it he'd be battling people that are not. See, he wants to go get his in the journal where he debates yeah. with you know, the Egyptologists, and that, that's his world. He's written; he's, he's an expert on the Book of the Dead. He's written; he's edited a book about the Book of the Dead, and it's all Egyptologists. It's unbelievable that they that they think they can hide behind an old boys' circle because you know the 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 TV stations and stuff will st still brand these guys. You know, I mean, it's good that that Hancock and others are getting more of the media uh, pie there, but they have an immediate you know connection because they're mainstream, you know, they're the Egyptologists. And so that, that, that gives them an unfair advantage and stuff. So, so anyways, I want to show you this though. On the screen here, it says Google Earth showing the distance from the Tomb of the Birds to the Great Pyramid. So there are, the, the Tomb of the Birds is exactly 
the, we're the middle of the Great Pyramid. Is. So east west, it's exactly there. So that that doesn't seem to be a chance. And so if the shortest distance between two points, you know, here it is. Okay, so you go from the Tomb of the Birds to the western edge of the Great Pyramid in a straight line. Okay, the distance is seven hundred forty nine point forty eight meters. Okay, all right. So the distance is 749.48. But if you take the whole diameter of the circle formed by that radius, okay, the distance is 1.4989 kilometers. All right. If you double that, it's the speed of light. So what is being revealed here? This is unbelievable because the tomb of the birds, it's darkness and light. It's the underground, the underworld, it's darkness and light. Okay. You go that way and you go back that way and you have the speed of light. Because 1.49, 9896 doubled is 299.792 and then three other digits that are different than the 458. But the point is to 99.9%, that is, it gives the speed of light. That cannot be by chance. It's at the same, okay? So here's the thing. To get that speed of light, you have to go two ways. And I've said this before. We don't know the speed of light. The speed, the one way speed of light has never been measured on planet earth it has never been measured we can't we don't have clocks sophisticated enough to start to send a signal from here and then finish it over here with a different clock so the only way we've measured the speed of light anybody that claims they know the speed of light the only way it's ever been measured is to bounce a signal off something and send it back because you're using the same clock then the clock where you started the beam of light is the same clock that clocks where it finishes and there's no way we can know it's the speed of light because we still don't know if it goes the same speed in the direction before it's reflected as it does being reflected back. It's possible being reflected back, it goes at a different speed. So all we know, all we know for talking so much about the speed of light is we know what the average of the two-way speed of light is. And here's the here's this tomb of the birds in the in the distance it is from the Great Pyramid saying it's a two, you got to go both ways to get the speed of light. It's unbelievable. 1.49896 times two is the speed of light. This is incredible. Dude, that's just a minute, dude, because that's fascinating. That is absolutely fascinating. It is totally fascinating. And that this is this is my discovery with my engineer Bob Criley. Because because I went to the tomb of the birds, like I said, I wanted to put it on Giza. I wanted to see, you know, I measured, I showed you some things I learned from measuring the the, the burial area, and then I put it on Google Earth and I'm finding this. It's like wow. But does that wow. say that that's how they were measuring the speed of light to determine the speed of light was by also reflecting it. Therefore, it needed the dual path. Therefore, they understood that no amount of measurement, but they were able to achieve that. Is that what that represents? Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is th this I, and I've done other videos about this in the King's Chamber, the same thing, the speed of light. I, I have a paper on academia, the speed of light revealed in the passages and chambers of the Great Pyramid. And in that paper, which is the top two percent of papers in academia, it's got it's had so many so many views. It's it's like a, so it's a book length. I mean, I I, I went and I, I ransacked the best measurements to to get this, and so it's and it's in meters too that's revealed. And so I have an appendix in there where I list probably ten or twelve ways that the speed of light you know appears in the Great Pyramid, and it, it and so in in the King's Chamber it's the same thing. It's the reflected thing reveals the speed of light and here it does it again so what i'm saying it seems to me brandon what what i think they're saying is because i don't know you said well they measure i have no idea how they measure the speed of light i mean i, I think it could go back to enoch and it was revealed to him by angels just the way john d you know uh, channeled angels and stuff that, sure. that he got a heavenly message and so that's been carried down and they never did really measure it themselves it was a revealed data point but it seems to me that they're saying it was just for them, it was the same as for us. There's a physical limit in the universe that exists right now. Now, supposedly, maybe with quantum computers or something, maybe someone can say we can make clocks sophisticated enough that we will someday be able to measure the one lay speed of light. But so far, it's never been done. It hasn't been done. No one has done it. We've never measured the one way speed of light. So this seems to be saying to me, yes, we recognize there's a physical limitation. And so we're, we're showing you the speed of light in a two way in a two-way deal here. I mean, <laughs> it's just so interesting, man. It, it, just because it again, it's the it's so scalable. Everything they did was just not to plop this over there, or plop that over there. It was so thought out. Okay, now I want to show you this. The shadows of the half speed of light. So here's that half speed of light circle we made. In the center is the tomb of the birds. So the tomb of the birds is the center of this light left circle. Okay, so I got I got the sun shines from over here. So the sun shines from straight east. So let's see what happens when it shines over the pyramids. Okay. 
So when it shines over the Great Pyramid, that's the shadow line that's formed. And the distance of that, the, the middle of that is 1.57 kilometers, which is pi over two. Hang on. I mean, how do you it, even think to measure the shadow of an eastern setting pyramid across a circle that you just discovered in the middle of nowhere? Yeah. And, and it how happens. How do you think of right that, Larry? Okay, look at this. Now, let's go. Let's go Khafre. So you got the sun shining from the east. So it casts a shadow over Khafre. It's 1.047 kilometers. It's pi over three. And then you go to Little Menkari and it casts a shadow and it's 432 meters. But they all line up where that circle is. And they, and they all line up on the circle. And this it's is the circle. Fascinating. Of, and, and look at, because I, I put those different colors because that's the shadow. Yeah. So this has, so the, the underworld, it's the tomb of the birds. It's the underworld. So we have to have some shadows here. There's got to be some shadowy stuff going on here. But you got the speed of light and, and these shadows hit the circle of, that's half the speed of light. So this this is, you know, just, this is amazing. If you think it's, about this, of course it would. Because think about the non-physical that's represented here in the shadow, right? I mean, we all cast shadows. It's a, it's a metaphor for us that we can physically see, but also it's sort of an etherical thing. So of course they would account for that. There's a physical object that casts an etheric shadow, and then they would account for that. This is fascinating. It, it is. It, it totally is. And I, I, this is just brand new to me. I mean, I, I, again, I just came back a few days and this is already the stuff I'm getting. So it's like, and I'm sure this has never been seen before because it, because somebody could question this, you know, because I, I, I can't say that, that, that this is just doing the, the geometry of it. I don't know because there's buildings and stuff in the East. I don't know if you could go out there, you know, in the, in the early morning and actually see a shadow that would look like this because of the nature of what's there. But in terms of just doing the geometry, this this is real. You know, I mean, I'm not, I didn't make this up. And it's you based know? on height and distance away from that Tomb of the Birds. So do you think that that was sort of the, how, are the Tomb of the Birds and the shaft, they're not the same thing? How far away from each other are they? Well, you know what? You know, Google Earth now boasts that, that you can do on your phone you know, what you used to do on the computer too. And and I, I swear to you, because that's where I was going with this in the beginning, when I started out with the Tomb of the Birds, but then I went to my holy shaft and I pointed out that it was, it was 300 meters from boss to boss. So it's not feet now. And be, because on my phone, I calculated it was exactly 900 feet from the Tomb of the, 900 meters from the Tomb of the Birds to the holy shaft. I thought, holy crap, there, it's not just exact 100. But then when I checked it today before your program, on the, on, it was not 900. And so I realized I, I must have made a mistake on my phone because usually I don't use my phone to calculate these things. I go to my computer, Google Earth, and do it that way. And so that misled me. So, so yes, it, it's, it's not an even – I found that out today before your program. It was kind of disappointing to me because I wish, that's where I was going with this. Now there's another thing. It's not just 100 feet increments. Now there's also a group of monuments that are 100 meter increments. But again, the Tomb of the Birds wasn't. So, okay, so look at this. There's the Tomb of the Birds. And uh, you got Hemiunu's tomb over there in the east. And, and uh, the southern part of his tomb is exactly lined up with the center of the Great Pyramid. Okay, so the Great Pyramid perimeter is 921.36 meters. That's the perimeter. Okay, now let's go from the Tomb of the Birds to the northeast corner of the of the tomb of Hemiunu, the architect of the Great Pyramid, and it's 921.36. Let's do the same thing to the southeastern corner of his tomb. It's 92136. For whatever reason, you're showing the perimeter of the Great Pyramid in the line from the Tomb of the Birds to the to the architect of the Great Pyramid, and probably the architect of the Giza Plateau. So 921.36 is a distance from the birds to the northeast and southeast corner of Hemayunu's tomb. Why? Now let me let me let me jump for a moment here and talk. Alan Green has a video that's gotten a lot of views where he takes the title page to Shakespeare's sonnets. Have you ever seen that? Huh. You, you've no, got to but see I will. That. Alan he Green. He takes the title page in the Shakespeare sonnets, sonnets and shows that all the major constants are there, including the modern ones, the, you know, um, Euler, Mascioni, square root of three, square root of five, five, pi, Euler, all of them are there. And then he shows the coordinates to the Great Pyramid are on the title page to Shakespeare's sonnets. Of course, you know, he's a, there's the uh, Stratfordians and the Oxfordians, and he's, of course, uh, an Oxfordian. 
there never was a Shakespeare. I don't know if you know that or not. Shakespeare never existed. Anybody, any other author you go to, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, they've all got letters they wrote to their girlfriends, their mothers. There's not one letter found anywhere by Shakespeare. Never wrote one letter to anybody. Shakespeare never existed. Those plays were written by John D., Francis Bacon, and a few others. And it was a, and so, so here's the point. To the extent that people have seen that the title page points out the Great Pyramid, Alan Green says it's 99.8% to the Great Pyramid. No, it isn't. It's 100%. The title page reveals the tomb of Hemiunu. This is a the, these secrets are carried down not by monuments, by men. Da Vinci knew these things. Da Vinci predicted the chamber that's been that that I said hasn't been revealed yet. The one that they 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 have found the large void that they found in 2017. They're they've actually taken pictures of it now, but they just haven't revealed it to the public. Da Vinci knew that chamber was there. There's a horizontal Vitruvian man that goes exactly where that was. So it's the it's the sages, it's Hemiunu, it's Da Vinci, it, you know, it's it's John D. It's individuals that are anointed that pass these things down. It's the brotherhood. Okay. So here, so what does it mean? Why? Why? Because Hemiunu is saying, I did all this. This is real. I planned this. It's not by chance. It's his way of saying. I'm showing you little things like this so that you can believe me when I show you the bigger things that are here and that have been hidden. Why have they been hidden? Why did Da Vinci hide things in the Vitruvian Man, in the Last Supper, in the Salvador Mundi? He plainly did. Why did he hide it? Why didn't he just write a paper and say, hey, you know? So, uh, I think I think that's what I prepared for you, Brandon. So it's fascinating, Larry. Um, OK, so for the audience, all the ways again to find him located down in the show notes. Let me ask you there when you, you had the circle pulled up, there was a lot over there that's eaten into Cairo where there's a lot of occupancy with a with the local folk. Is yeah. anything been found in that area? Is there perhaps some underground things that are existing under the city out there? Because there's a lot of that. Well, circle yeah, and, and Mansour Boulevard, they they that's where they found the Khufu Valley Temple. It's it's one of those streets that's out of ways in there, and they were dusting up for a sewer, and they found the granite, or not the granite, the uh, the uh, the the black basalt out there. That's the same as is on the east side of the Great Pyramid where that temple is. And they bulldozed, you know, the Egyptian government did did urban renewal and went in and just bulldozed down all the houses of the poor people right on the east side of the Great Pyramid because they want to build five-star hotels and they wanted to get the archaeology. And so you, I was out there, I was surprised. I went out there with an Egyptian guy and I was I saw the guards watching me from up there and I thought, I'm getting in trouble. He said, you're not going to get in trouble with me and because uh, he's a local guy. And so I walked through the areas because I used to be they didn't let you walk there guaranteed it was like because I was told that the president just didn't he didn't get the approval of the Congress because it was like it was like the the Passover in that I, I was doing stories on Instagram and somebody told me to stop or that I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble there were marks on all the houses that are now down I I I, I was taking video of all these red marks that were on all the houses there meaning and like sure the movie Fern Gully they put they, X's they, on the trees that they were going to cut down. It was horrible. Yeah, they, they've they've all been knocked down now, and it was and they had armed guards day and night there once they knocked it down because you know Zahi Awas has always wanted to get at the archaeology that's underneath there. That's where the Khufu Causeway was. People have gotten the reason that every okay, I, I I could show you a video of a guy's house I was in, one of the ones that was knocked down. I was I, I was in a carriage with my with my wife Lynn, and I said I want to go out and, and find just what you're asking the question you're just asking. I said I want to go to the spot where the Kufa Valley Temple was, which is out in the village, and see if you can see any signs of underneath the drugstores or something. I knew I wouldn't, but I just thought I, I want to say I went there because I had the GPS. And as the guy who was taking us in the horse heard my wife and I say Causeway, he goes Causeway, Causeway. He turns off from taking me where I asked him to take me. He takes me to his house, which is right next to the Great Pyramid, one of the houses that's since been knocked down. He pulls out the lug, the rug in his living room, and there's a tunnel going underneath to the, to the Giza Plateau. And all of those houses have them. This is known because, because so many people have gotten rich through selling these things they find on the black market. There's still a, a huge uh, you know, appetite for those things by rich people. And so they're sold on the black market. So, And so to poor people, it's like, Hey, there's gold in them there are hills. There's right. gold in California. All these people go there. So oh, poor people always dig because there are so many real stories of people who have become rich. And so they all had tunnels 
going in into into the plateau underneath to the Great Pyramid, different things like that. So when that was all bulldozed down, you know, <laughs> they covered all those and they, you know, they so it was again, it was armed guards for months. You couldn't go there. So I was surprised to find now, you know, a year, a year later. That I was able to walk through the rubble, and the, and the, so you can walk on the causeway. The causeways there, you can see the stones that go out right right through the where the village was, and who knows what they pulled out of there. You know, I mean, and uh, it's a long story, but you know, the, the, a lot of those people were not happy because you know their whole life is there in Singiza, their whole family is there, and sure, the government's offering them a part an apartment in the sixth of October city, but none of their path folk pathways pathways are there. None of their relatives are there. There's no local transportation for them. And so they didn't, many of them didn't even take the housing that the government gave them, you know, when, when their stuff was knocked down. So anyways, that's, hmm. yeah. Damn. It's, it's just so interesting. Just everything, everything you talk about is just fascinating. You're like, yeah, I went over here and then yeah, just tunnels under everybody's house. Like, again, Larry, this is, this uh, yeah, is just I mean, incredible. I could, it's, it's, yeah, there, there, there was a famous story. Six people died, you know, because as they tunnel down, they've got to put, bracing up like you know like a like the the, the timbers in, in, in a coal mine you know yeah and so six guys were down there and, and it collapsed and and all six died oh it's just because God. men take that serious they're poor the one hope they have of doing something they're not going to become a professional basketball player and get out of that ghetto they're not going to what are they going to do they dig they dig they all do it they dig to find artifacts that they then sell in the black market the black market families are known it's not like we don't know who they are. You know, yeah. they know, they know where to take it if they find it. They don't tell the Egyptian government. That's that's been that cat and mouse game between those poor people and Zahi Was and the government forever. So they finally knocked it all down. They because they've all known for years it could happen. It's so, like it, Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade. You know, and young Indiana Jones finds the cross and he wants to give it to a museum, but old boy was like, no, I, I want the money. Yeah. <laughs> Tale as old as t old shit being found, right? Yeah, that's right. Larry Paul, all the ways to find you located down in the show description. Thank you again, my friend. You come back any damn time. You know that. Brandon, it's been great. I enjoy being with you. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, come to Egypt with me, people. I still have a trip planned in March. Come in March, March 7th through the 17th. I'll be there. Come with we're, me. We're going, guys. Uh, write me in if you want to take him up on that, seriously. Like, write me in, expandingrealitypodcast at gmail.com. Write me in. If y'all want to go, let me know. We'll put something together. That'd be a blast. We'll go explore the right. Tomb of the Birds, man, for yeah, sure. You and me will make an early morning excursion to the Tomb of the Birds with, with ropes and, and good lights. And good lights. That's right. Absolutely. Larry, I'm there, dude. Dude, thank you All again right. so much, brother. This is awesome. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Brandon.